Ye must be born again. The subject for today's study. Uh, it's a very important study. Uh, there's a debate that goes on. Let me show you how this thing works. And what people do is they say that uh, Jesus and Peter both preached, they both said the only two times in the Bible that the words born again show up is with Jesus and Peter. So Jesus and Peter taught that you are to be born again, uh, while the Apostle Paul in the Pauline epistles, he didn't say anything about being born again. All right, so he said, Paul says a new creature. So this whole thing comes in where um, Jesus and Paul or Peter preached one thing, Paul preached something else. Um, no, that's hyper dispensationalism. Now, there were some things in the Gospels that Jesus was preaching that certainly were for the millennial kingdom and, and saints in the time of Jacob's trouble, no doubt. But we're going to see from the scriptures here today in terms of the gospel there and in this issue of being, I shouldn't say in terms of the gospel, in terms of being born again, they're all preaching the same thing. All right, I'm going to prove it to you. You say, well, it doesn't say born again in the Pauline epistles. Well, the Pauline epistles don't have a lot of words. You know, the hell is not there. Uh, that means Paul never preached on hell. I mean, give me a break. Uh, no, it doesn't work that way. Let's start out here by going to John chapter 3 where this statement, ye must be born again, is found. We're going to look at all the references to being born again in the King James Bible. John chapter 3. We're going to see what this, what does it mean to be born again. I'm going to show you some very interesting things in this study. John chapter 3, we'll begin in verse uh, 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, there's the first reference in the Bible, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, Ye must be born again. There's no conditional clauses or any kind of a, Well, ye must be born again unless you are, or if you feel like it, or whatever. Ye must be born again. It's a command that Jesus gave. Verse 8. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Now here's the very, very important part here. Born again is synonymous in this passage with born of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit needs to be formed inside of you. Just kind of spoil the whole point of the sermon here. Born again means that you have the Holy Spirit born in you. The Holy Spirit is formed within you. All right. That's the main difference between false professing Christians and true Christians, truly saved, born again Christians. There's a supernatural event that happens. See, there's a lot of people out there. I mean, there are literally billions of people that claim to be Christians, and yet they're not born again. The Holy Spirit never moved in. They're literally empty vessels walking around, their own spirit, which is dead in trespasses and sins. They have no new birth there. All right? And we're going to see here, as we go through this study, that yes, Paul does teach the thing of being born again. We will, I will show you the proof. Okay? And... Uh, some other very interesting things. But you see this thing there, born again means born of the Spirit. That's what Jesus is talking about there. These guys are going around, the Pharisees there, Nicodemus, uh, verse 1, uh, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. What was he doing? Going about to establish his own righteousness. Righteousness which is apart from the Holy Spirit. The Pharisees, their number one sin 
was they created tradition and elevated their traditions above the Word of God. That was their number one sin. That was what the problem with the Pharisees was. The, the Sadducees, they didn't believe the miracles. They didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in heaven, or the uh, angels, excuse me. They didn't believe a lot of the supernatural things. They'd be the modern-day liberal. Pharisees would be the modern-day Catholic and a lot of the others out there that elevate their own traditions, like Baptists and whatever else, that, and Lutherans and all of the you know, Protestant denominations. And Baptists, modern-day Baptists are just another Protestant denomination. Don't give me this stuff. Well, we're not part of the Protestants. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. You have the same church buildings, the same Sunday best, the same altar, the pulpit, and all the other stuff that's nowhere in the New Testament. You have the same Protestant trappings as all the others. So independent fundamental Baptists are Protestants. That's all that they are. And they elevate their traditions above the Scriptures. Well, I know the Bible doesn't say such and such, but we still do it. You're a Pharisee. You are. And it's not because you're, you know, I'm some liberal that, you know, attacks you because you have standards. No. I'm a conservative Bible believer who attacks the Baptists because they elevate their traditions of men above the Scriptures. That's why I attack them, for the same reason Jesus Christ attacked the Pharisees of his day. Pharisees, those who hold their traditions above the Scriptures. Sadducees, the liberals that reject, you know, they would be called evangelical. They don't want to be called fundamentalist. All right, they reject the supernatural aspects of Scripture, essentially. And then the scribes, of course, would be your new version people that have no authority on the earth better, you know, more than their mind. The new version, you know, well, this could be better translated. I think the Greek word here would be better, you know, more accurately. The, the nuance of the Greek is, you know, unclear in this particular passage. So we, yeah, Pharisees, no higher authority than themselves in their education. All right. Those are the three groups that Jesus hated, hated the groups there, told them that they were going to hell, and they were the ones that killed him. They were the ones that came, that rose up and put Jesus Christ to death. The same way that they would do it to this very day. Jesus Christ shows up on the earth and he would be saying the same things. It'd be the same groups of people that would kill him. <laughs> All right, I represent Jesus Christ. I stand for the word of God, the King Jesus version. If you've seen my studies on that. If you haven't, you need to watch those. I stand for the holy, perfect, pure word of God. And the same Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes attack me to this very day. I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. But Jesus Christ is inside of me. He was formed in me. Okay, that's why I'm born again, because I'm born of the Spirit, you see. Paul teaches this same thing. But you get into this whole thing of, well, Jesus and Peter taught something that Paul didn't teach. Uh, born again and new creature are two different things. No, they're not. Well, they're spelled differently, Brother Brian. I get that. I understand. But you can go, when you get too far with the dispensational thing, you start to head into hyper-dispensationalism, and then you're finished, okay? The devil, just listen to me, the devil loves to take Christians too far in a right doctrine. There's a lot of things out there like dispensationalism that are completely scriptural, 100%. You cannot rightly divide the word of truth unless you're dispensational. You have to divide the word of truth. It isn't all written to you, okay? Obviously, Old Testament, New Testament is the most simple of the two, you know, or the dispensational divisions that are there. Anybody that says, oh, it's all the same, Genesis to Revelation, uh, walk away or rather run away from them. All right. But what the devil does is he takes dispensationalism and he says, Peter and, John, and Paul, they preached two different gospels. They were two different bodies of Christ and satanic heresy. All right. First century there, there weren't two different groups. Okay, there was a, the Jewish saved and then the Gentile saved of Paul. They're two different groups. That is nonsense. It is a satanic heresy. And I'm going to debunk it today in this study just to give you the scriptures so that you can do the same. 1 Peter chapter 1. We'll go to the next, the final instance of being born again. And again, if, you're, if you've been repeating this thing, Christians today are not born again because it doesn't say born again in the Pauline epistles. You need to repent of it. You really need to repent of it. Because I'm going to give you the scriptures today to show that you're wrong. And that that system is wrong. And when you're shown that you're wrong from the scriptures, you need to change. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23 through 25. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. 
The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word by, which by the gospel is preached unto you. Is there anything in those three verses that doesn't apply to us? You know, you say, well, I'm, a, I'm a, of Paul, you know, and whatever else. It's funny because Paul actually rebuked that thing. One was saying, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos. And he says, you know, who are, who are we, basically? You know, it's God that saves. It, don't say that you're of me or of Peter or whatever else. He rebukes it, and yet you have people that read the Pauline epistles, and they just see right past that rebuke. Kind of weird. But uh, what's going on there? You are born again by the Word of God. You're not born again by your own thoughts. Some magical thing comes upon you. You're walking out through the forest or something, and a beam of light comes down from heaven and says, I'm here to save you. Yes, I'll be saved. Okay, thank you. You know, No. You read about the account of Scripture. You put your faith in what this book says. Events that happened nearly 2,000 years ago. That's what you do. All right? It's not that you get saved by mystical things and word of mouth or something. No, it has to tie back to this book right here, this Bible, the King James Bible. 2 Peter chapter 3. Go to 2 Peter chapter 3. Say, well, you know, he was preaching to the, another group there, and, you know, and this another satanic movement has come out where they say that Peter and the other apostles, they rejected the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was a false prophet. They couldn't stand him, they hated him. Um, so you have hyper dispensationalists saying that, that uh, Paul was part of a different body, Peter was part of, di of a different body. They had the church of the one body, and then the the Bride of Christ, or something like this. There's different variations depending on who you listen to. I wouldn't recommend listening to any of them. But they come out with all this nutty stuff, and I've dealt with hyper-dispensationalists over the years, so don't talk to me about it. I, I know what I'm saying here. But they'll come out with these different things, and you have the one group that says that, you know, uh, Peter and Paul preach different things, and you have another one saying, oh, yes, they preach different things, and in fact, Peter hated Paul. And, they call, and condemned him and things like that. And all you have to do is just read the King James Bible, read the scriptures, and you'll see that, that neither stand is true. Let me show you. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. An account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. Uh, I don't think... Peter is part of a different uh, body of Christ. He calls him a beloved brother. All right, they're both part of the same body. I'll show you another scripture on that here in a, in a minute or two. Um, so this teaching that Peter and Paul are, are enemies or that they're teaching different gospels, you can just reject that right away because the Bible doesn't teach it. Verse 16, As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, under their own destruction. Hyperdispensationalists. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, <laughs> fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Okay? Warning there. Hey, Paul's my brother. He's my beloved brother. Watch out for people to try to pervert and rest the scriptures that Paul has written about and try to say that we're teaching different things essentially is what's going on there. So this teaching that, well, Jesus and Peter said born again, Paul says new creature. It's not the same thing. They're not preaching the same thing. That is a satanic heresy. I am born again. Peter was born again. Paul was born again. Born of the Spirit. New creatures in Christ Jesus. I mean, okay, I'm a new creature. How did that happen if you're not born again? You, you know, well, you become a, a new creature just all of a sudden, and it's not really the same thing as being born again. It, you know, ugh. <laughs> really weird. 1 Timothy chapter 6. First Timothy chapter 6. Verse 3 through 5. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus 
Christ. Paul writing here. The words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Ye must be born again. Huh. Start over here. Let me just get back into context. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. Okay, um, very strong admonition there. You stay away from these people that are trying to say you don't need to consent to the words of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ said born again, and Peter said born again, who calls Paul a beloved brother, but Paul, he was against what they were doing, apparently. Um, no, no, not at all. When you come in and you have this stuff of, oh, you don't, you're not really born again now, that is a perverse disputing of men of corrupt minds. And I realize there's probably some of you out there that are good viewers of this ministry and whatever else, and you've been led away by the error of the wicked by hyper-dispensational heretics. Okay, there are some things that you can look and you can rightly divide and you can say, okay, there's really no basis for this. The Sermon on the Mount, it's before Jesus died on the cross. They are still doctrinally in the Old Testament. Who is he speaking to? You know, certainly. There are certain things that are written about that are for the time of Jacob's trouble. Certainly. Okay, I believe Paul wrote the, the book of Hebrews. But you look and you say, okay, but in Galatians it says there's neither Jew nor Gentile. Why would he write solely to the Hebrews? He's talking about our fathers and all this other, you know, all these other things that would clearly refer to the nation of Israel. Why, why would Paul write that? Well, we have to, re, you know, uh, follow everything that Paul wrote. Well, if you're trying to follow the book of Hebrews, you're going to have a problem. It's doctrinally not towards a Christian in the New Testament, right? In the church age, if you want to call it that. The time where the body of Christ is on the earth. The book of Hebrews is not about that. Now, there are things in the book of Hebrews which doctrinally can be applied to us. All right, You go through, you, you look at, that, of, at those things. There are things back in the Old Testament that were written for our learning, certainly. But when you start to get into this thing of hyper-dispensationalism where you should say only the Pauline epistles, that's all our doctrine comes from, you're in a mess. You get in a really big mess. And the, the doctrine of the new birth, of being born again, is completely consistent with what Paul writes. And, you know, Paul right here in 1 Timothy chapter 6 is referring back to the words of Jesus Christ. Let me show you a good verse to kick the hyper-dispensational thing. Uh, Romans chapter 16. And this shuts them up. I've actually used this in person on hyper-dispensationalists. Knew one many years ago. A friend of the family, and, and um, he was a just a normal professing Christian for a long time, and then the, he got to hanging out with uh, some hyper-dispensationalist that convinced him that he didn't really understand the Bible correctly, and he had to come to his special classes and read Cornelius Stamm's book and all this other stuff. He actually gave me a copy of it. Um, so, I guess I've been back and forth with hyper-dispensationalists, not on YouTube either. All right, <laughs> Romans chapter 16, verse 7. Here's how you slam a hyper-dispensationalist. Because they teach that Peter had was in part of one body and then the gospel was given to Paul. The dis dispensation of the grace of God is given to Paul and then now we're in that. And Peter you know, was to the, to the Jews and Paul, you know, the gospel of the uncircumcision was to, for Peter to give to the Jews and the gospel of the circumcision was given to, or, no, excuse me, I have that backwards. Gospel of the circumcision was for Peter. Paul got the gospel of the uncircumcision. That's what they teach. Romans chapter 16, verse 7. Salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. Uh-oh. Big problem for hyper-dispensationalists because they don't teach that the people that were saved there before Paul, they don't teach that they're in Christ. It's the church of the one body or something like this. Or, like I said, they have different terms for it. There's some argument within the hyper-dispensational movement. Imagine that. Uh, but that's what they'll do. Oh, well, there's, there's this special group, you know, and, and well, then what do you do with Romans chapter 16, verse 7? Paul lists a few people and says, they were in Christ before me. 
You say, well, then they always preach the same gospel. No, there's some transition throughout the book of Acts. As the gospel's first presented to the Jewish people, they're given another chance to accept Jesus as their Messiah. And Acts chapter 2, verse 38 is a gospel that was preached early on there. Baptism and things. Um, fine, that was preached then. But the Jews as a nation rejected the Lord, and so the gospel starts to go to the Gentiles. And by the time you know you get a few centuries in, it's pretty much the Gentiles that are getting saved for the last, you know, nearly two thousand years. Not quite two thousand years, I know. But you understand what I'm saying. It's primarily the Gentiles now that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and are Christians. But did Paul ever speak of being born again? Let's check about that. First Corinthians, you say, well, no, he, he never said the term born again. Okay. And this, this is another one of the things that I've seen simple-minded people, they get taken out on this whole thing. Did you know the word repent is not in the book of John? You know, and they go, oh, really? Yes, yeah, so you don't have to repent, you know, to be saved and whatever else because it's not in the book of John. <laughs> You know, these Gnostic heretics come along and they'll do these little word games like that. And this is another one of the word games that they'll play. Not the Gnostic heretics. Well, maybe they do too, but the hyper-dispensationalists. They'll come along and they'll say, Paul never said the term born again. Therefore, you don't have to be born again. Well, actually, Paul did say born again. It's just in two different verses. I'm going to show you the proof. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 8. Okay, he's talking about, first of all, he gives the gospel there. Um, in uh, verse uh, 3 and 4, and then he goes into the thing uh, of how many people have been seeing him and whatever else. But look at verse 8. And last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. Born out of due time? Is he talking about his physical birth? No. <laughs> He wasn't saying, I was born out of due time. I was just born a little bit later. No. What's he talking about? We say born as in carried, as moved. You know, Maybe that's it. That's B-O-R-N-E, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and that doesn't make any sense either. Let's just say he's carried out of due time. Uh, no. What's he talking about, brethren? As of one born out of due time. Born again. He's received the new birth. He's born out of due time. You see, but okay, it doesn't say again. Born, yes, there, but it doesn't say born again. Let's go to the word again, and here we're going to see something very interesting. Go to Galatians. This is where it gets very interesting. And this is something I've struggled with for a long time, and this... The Lord revealed this to me while doing this study, and I thought, well, there's the answer I've been looking for. Galatians chapter 4, verse uh, 19, and down to verse 20. My little children, of whom I travail in birth again uh, until Christ be formed in you, I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice, for I stand in doubt of you. So are the words born and again in the Pauline epistles? Well, not side by side, but they're in two different places, and they both mean that they're referring to the new birth. All right? One born out of due time, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 8. Travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. So yes, Paul does have those two words, not side by side. I get it, but it's, he's teaching the concept of the thing of the new birth. Born of the Spirit. Has the Holy Spirit moved in yet? Okay. But here's the interesting thing. Look at verse 19. My little children of whom I travail in birth again. Travail in birth again? Well, Paul's a man. He's not, obviously, he's not talking about giving birth to a physical child. What's he talking about? He's travailing in birth again. Why? Until Christ be formed in you. I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice, for I stand in doubt of you. Oh boy. Boy, this is a, a really major scripture here that I've been looking at and thinking about for so many years. I can't tell you how many people I have seen, and I think, praise Lord, they got saved. 
and they're learning, they seem to be learning the right things, and all of a sudden it's just, they're going along and poof, they, get, they hit some doctrinal issue that's something there, and, and they just go whoop, right back to the world, and they completely reject everything that they've learned, and they go back, and the latter end is worse, worse with them than the beginning. And I say, well, they're a false convert. Oh, no, they're not. They're just carnal. They're, they're not a false convert. You know, and I, I look at that and it bothers me. And I've, I've thought over the years, you know, I mean, I don't want to just go around and say anybody that doesn't wear red and black buffalo plaid, you know, or doesn't have a beard or something as a guy or that doesn't live off grid or, you know, by things I get accused of and just lost, 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 lost. That's what people say about me, that I just judge everybody's salvation, everybody's lost but me. That's not true. That's not true at all. Um, I love to see people genuinely get saved and genuinely be led into the truth and stand by the truth. And the Lord shows them things and, and I can say, okay, hands off. That brother or sister over there, they're doing fine. Great. I know that I can trust them. They're, they're out there. But then I hear about these people and I think they got saved watching my videos or other videos and I've counseled them and I've been there to answer their questions and I've, you know, tried to help them and they go back to the world and they get messed up in some really wacko doctrines or whatever else. And I think, what's going on there? And I start to travail in birth again. I start to think, did they really get saved? I thought that they were saved. I don't understand why they would get into that. And it starts to bother me. That's what Paul's talking about there. But there's a really interesting thing that he says here. Verse 19, travail and birth again until Christ be formed in you. Huh. You mean to tell me somebody could make a profession of faith like the Galatian believers did and Christ isn't formed in them yet? That's what the text is saying, brethren. They're not born again. I'm a Christian. I go to such First Baptist Church and I you know, lead singing and I'm in the choir and I go door to door and whatever. Is, has Christ been formed in you? Are you born of the Spirit? Are you born again? And I've talked to people that profess to be Christians. They'll see my bumper magnets or whatever else and they'll come up and they'll say, oh, I, I really enjoy your bumper stickers. And I say, and they'll say, I'm a Christian too or something. And I say, oh, are you born again? And they'll give me this look of, uh, uh, you know, well, I go to such and such Baptist church. It's not what I asked. Are you born again? And they'll say, uh, you know, I've seen them, they'll go, yes, yes. You know, <laughs> I think, what? Uh, is there, has there been a change in your life? Has something happened after you got saved? Can you look back at your past life as a lost man or woman and say, I can't even relate to that person back there anymore. It's like I was a, I'm a different person. That's why I did my testimony video when I say that, you know, Brian Denlinger passed away, I think it was when I was about 26 years old. And I have a hard time remembering that time period and what I used to do and what I used to think because it was literally a thing of, okay, I died at that time and I was buried. That old man's gone. I don't even think about that old guy anymore in terms of just, uh, what, how did I used to do this or that? He's dead. He's gone. He's buried. I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus now. I'm born again. <laughs> new creature because I'm born again. Let me say it that way. But a lot of these people, they've never experienced a new birth. Gnostic, Gnosticism, where you envision things, you imagine in your mind. I can imagine Jesus dying on the cross. All right, I'm sorry about the little technical difficulty. My uh, battery system died here off-grid trying to do this study. Um, but getting back to what I was saying, this thing of people that claim that they're saved, they claim that they're Christians, but this Gnostic thing is how they got saved. They hear the wonderful sermon, the music's playing just right, they're caught up in the emotion of the moment, and they make an intellectual decision up here. I believe, and I don't, they don't, I mean, these people literally teach you don't even have to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved, even though the Bible plainly says so. Um, in Romans chapter 10, and elsewhere, the people are calling upon the Lord to be saved. And you don't even have to pray. You don't even have to ask God, and then there doesn't have to be any supernatural change in your life. 
It's Gnosticism. You are imagining things. You're imagining, I am saved because I declare I'm saved. I believe that I'm saved. It's all up here in your head. Uh, that's a problem, okay? That's not true biblical salvation. You must be born again, period, okay? But what about this thing of Christ being formed in you? Let's go to Galatians uh, chapter 2. I'll show you some supporting scriptures for this thing. Um, and again, I've seen this thing where there are people that make a profession of faith and Christ isn't formed in them because there's no spirit, Holy Spirit connection there. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. The old man dies, in other words. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. The old man doesn't continue to live. But look at this. But Christ liveth in me. Christ liveth in me. Christ is formed in me. That's the new birth, brethren. The new birth isn't some kind of a thing of, hey, I'm going to declare I'm born again now because I can follow a bunch of standards of a certain system. Or, No, the Spirit of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible actually teaches all three parts of the Godhead are in a Christian, by the way. Uh, that's a whole other video I've done before. But the Spirit of God moves into your body. So now my interest, interests change. Not because, well, I read in the Scriptures and I'll conform to such and such confession of faith. No, something changed within me. That's why now I detest certain types of music. My speech is cleaned up from the way that it used to be. I want to conform to this book right here because I'm born again. You see, it's not wrong to use that term. Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. The life that I'm now living is for the Lord. Why? Because his spirit is within me. Christ has been formed in me. All right? I'll give you another verse to think about here. 1 Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter three. Um, first Peter chapter three, verse three and four. Speaking about women here, saved women, it says, "Whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart." Hmm. And that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which is in the sight of God of great price. The hidden man of the heart, who would that be? I think that would be Jesus. All right, go to 2 Timothy chapter 1. To another very important verse here, 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 14. Now, here's an, an interesting uh, tie-in with the Godhead doctrine. First, or 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 14 says, That good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost, which dwelleth in us. I thought it said Christ dwelleth in us. Um, but now it says the Holy Ghost dwelleth in us. How could that be? Uh, because it's the same God. It's one person. It's one being. It's not three separate persons. All right. But again, until Christ be formed in you. What's he talking about? Paul is questioning the salvation of the believers in Galatia, and he's saying, I'm travailing in birth again. Why? Because I don't think you're born again. I don't think you're born of the Spirit. I have to just wait and see until Christ be formed in you. And, you know, this is the, the toughest part of ministry is watching people and having to decide, you know, are they just, is it they, they've gotten messed up a little bit here? Is there chastening as a result of them getting messed up? Are they an infiltrator? Are they fakes? Are they frauds? Is it real? But they're just, you know, getting into things. They got led away and they, are they going to come back? Or, you know, it's very difficult. And that's why I believe that as a Christian, you should be just as radical as you can.
And I know I've talked to people too, by the way, and I say, you know, when did you get saved? Well, I prayed back there and then I messed up a bunch of times and whatever, and I kind of rededicated my life to the Lord and that's really when things started to change. What if the initial prayer was you calling upon the Lord and the Lord's looking and he's saying, okay, I'm going to start to slowly form Christ in you. And all those years later, when you're done messing around with the whatever, and you truly come to the point where you're broken, you say, okay, I'm done with all the sin and all the self-righteousness and everything else. I believe that Jesus died for me, but now I really understand why I need that. I really understand that I'm not a good person. Maybe then at that point in time is when Christ is formed in that person. And until then, they've been faking it. And don't tell me people can't fake Christianity. All right, that's another one that amazes me. Oh, nobody could fake being a Christian. Oh, please. You are so inexperienced if you say that. I mean, I've had atheists, and they'll literally mockingly, Oh, I believe Jesus died for my sins. Oh, and they'll laugh about it. They'll do it mockingly. But they confess Jesus openly before men. But they did it in a mocking way. And look at all the people out there that have made professions of faith. They say that they believe the gospel, and they don't live at all according to the scriptures. All right? Christ must be formed in somebody. And if you're seeing that, you see somebody that you talk to about the Lord and they've acted like that they got saved and they've, you know, been changing their life and all of a sudden they go back to the world, you start to travail in birth again. Why? Because they're not born again. That's why. Christ hasn't been formed in them yet. Once the Holy Spirit's there, you still will sin, you still will get messed up, but there are some things you don't change. And if those things are not there, well, that's a problem. Um, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 15 through 20. The Bible says here, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? Can you say that as a Gnostic gospel professing Christian? No, you can't. You can't say I'm owned by God. There's no physical, spiritual connection to God. There isn't anything there. It's all up just here in your mind. For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Huh. Born of the spirit? Born again? Your body belongs to God. But so does your spirit. Why? Because Christ has been formed in you. The Holy Ghost dwelleth in us. You're born again. Born of the Spirit. Do you have the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Yes, I do. That's why I believe the truth. That's not speaking in tongues, believe you me. That was a sign gift given to convert the Jews. And uh, there's, there's a gift of tongues in terms of people can learn languages. But that's why you also have the thing of discerning, of, or not discerning, but uh, interpretation of tongues. Uh, you don't need that when it's a Holy Ghost sign gift for people. You can just start speaking in their language. It's a way to witness to the Jews that are scattered abroad. You go through all throughout the book of Acts, every time the miraculous gift of speaking in tongues is done, there are Jews present. When Paul's writing to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 through 14, He's just simply talking about spiritual gifts. There are some Christians that are really good at saying and learning and speaking and interpreting other languages. You know, the Bible, you want to translate it into some other language. Some people might not have the Bible in their language. You're going to have to have that gift of tongues there. John chapter 14. I'll show you the importance of the thing of the Holy Spirit coming upon you and the true manifestation of it and not some kind of a faking of a Jewish sign gift. You have to watch out for the Charismatics. They're another group that's really bad. Hyper-dispensationalists and hyper-Calvinists and Charismatics. The three worst groups that there are. Um, 
John chapter 14, beginning in verse 15. If ye love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Oh, well, so-and-so is saved, brother. They just, you know, they kind of went back to the world or whatever. No, that doesn't work. The Holy Spirit seals you. God purchases you, and he moves his spirit into you. Christ is formed in you. The hidden man of the heart. You see what I'm saying? That's the new birth, brethren. It isn't some kind of a thing of, well, I can do this thing myself and whatever else. No, you can't. When the new birth happens, when you become born again and a new, new creature in Christ Jesus, it's because the Holy Spirit has moved in. Okay? And we'll see that. Look at verse 17. Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. The world can't receive the Holy Spirit of truth. They can fake it. They can imitate it. But I've seen this thing so many times. Dividing lines between Christians. I'm a Christian. What are you doing with that NIV? It's just as good as the King James Bible. King James onlyism is divisive. You're not saved. Bye-bye. I'm a Christian and I believe in theistic evolution. Uh, that goes against the scripture. Sorry. Goodbye. I'm a Christian, but I believe that uh, God chose everybody before the foundation of the world and that non-elect people can't get saved. Go away, stupid Calvinist. Bye-bye. You know, I'm a Christian, but I believe in the Trinity. And I refuse to say Godhead and I will not submit to Trinity as Orthodox Christianity. There are three persons. There's God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. And Goodbye. Goodbye. You're adding to the scriptures. You're messing things up. You're lying about the Godhead. Bye-bye. Well, they're right in everything else, Brother Brian. We shouldn't judge them. Yes, we should judge them. Christ hasn't been formed in those people. They're not born again. They haven't received the new birth. Verse 17. Start over here. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. He's referring to himself. How do you know? Look at verse 18. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. I will come to you. Verse 19. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. We have fellowship with the Lord. And it isn't just, you know, well, with the Holy Spirit, yes, but Jesus and the Father, they're up there in heaven, you know, um, playing catch the ball or something. I don't know what they'd be playing. Father and Son are two different persons after all. Two different gods, God the Father, God the Son. Oh, but they're the same God. They're just two different titles. They're not the same, but they are the same. Trinitarianism, bunch of nonsense. When you know God, you know all three parts of the Godhead. Okay? It's that simple. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. You'll be born again, born of the Spirit. Christ is formed in you. That's what's going on. Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? I mean, why would Judas not, you know, not Iscariot, why would he say that? Shouldn't everybody be given the wonderful Christian life experience and whatever else? No, they shouldn't. How are you going to manifest yourself to us and not to the other lost people out there? Verse 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. And my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Our abode? What's an abode? Where you live? The Lord's going to live inside of you? Be formed in you? Be born of the Spirit? Yes. Verse 24, He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, that, or spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, Jesus just said, I'm, you know, that he's, I'm going to come to you. 
I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. But he's the comforter. Hmm. Whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Now again, let's go back to the thing that happened in, in the Galatia. Here you have Paul, and he comes to these Galatian believers. They make a profession of faith, and Paul says, Wow, praise the Lord. They're born again. They're saved, I think. <laughs> and all of a sudden they start to say, I think we're justified by the works of the law. Yeah, I think that uh, you know we need to go back to acting like Jews, and we need to start telling other people to act like Jews, and we can't say Jesus. We'll have to say Yeshua and all this other stuff. We'll start to say, you know, keep the Sabbath day and all this. And Paul comes back and he says, so you're now justified by the law? What? I'm afraid of you, lest I've bestowed upon you labor in vain. You know, I, don't you understand what the law is about? The law just breaks you down and, and, okay, I'm a sinner. I need Jesus Christ. I can't save myself. The law isn't there for you to save yourself. If you're trying to save yourself, then that proves you aren't really born again. I have to travail in birth now again. I have to look at you and say, I don't know about this group. I desire to be with you and to change my voice before I stand in doubt of you. Let me get real personal. I wonder what would happen if I could take on a disguise and come through the screen and look into your life. Would I think that you're saved if I could see your personal life? Oh, how cultic, how terrible, how I can't believe that he would actually want to do. Uh, don't worry about me. Worry about the Lord. You can fake me out. I'm rather stupid along those lines because I'm actually a very nice guy and I want to see people get saved and, and things. I've had a lot of people fake me out over the years. Um, many times my wife has said, oh, I don't think that they're saved. And I, oh, come on. I, I, they say this and they say that and they turn out later on to be fake. And it breaks my heart. I don't like that. But um, you can't fake the Lord. You better remember that. Verse 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If ye loved me, ye would rejoice, because I said I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. Soul is greater than the body. Easy to figure that out. And now I have told you before it come to pass, that when it is come to pass, ye might believe. Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh, and hath nothing in me. But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Arise, let us go hence. <laughs> Alright, there's spiritual fellowship that has to be there, if you're genuinely born again. If you are genuinely saved, there's spiritual fellowship. You say, it's, well, I don't really see it there, I don't really know for sure if I have that, I can't really say for sure I'm born again. Well, that's a problem. That's a big problem. So, uh, Galatians 4.19, we were there earlier. Let's go back again. Need to look at that thing here. Just show you another interesting type of a born-again Christian. This is a really interesting one. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 19. My little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Question. Um, was there anyone else in the Bible who had Christ formed in them before he died on the cross? You say, well, the only one that would have been would have been uh, the Virgin Mary. Mm -hmm. You're correct about that. You say... Uh, Okay, what's the point? I don't understand. Well, Christ is supposed to be formed in us. So in a sense, in a weird sort of way, the Virgin Mary is a type of a Christian. So wait a second. Did he just say that? Hey, honey, you have to come here. I think Denlinger's finally lost his mind. You know, I think he's finally going crazy. He just said that Christians are a type of the Virgin Mary. We're a bunch of little Virgin Marys walking around. Yeah, he did just say that, didn't he? Yes, he did. <laughs> okay, you say that's crazy that's weird 
Stick with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. This is a little nugget of the English King James Bible, proving how superior our English King James Bible is to anything else out there. You know, well, that's just terrible, the Texas Receptus. What about the Texas Receptus? Well, go read it. I don't care. Uh, I don't have time to waste with a dead language. Oh, it's horrible, isn't it? Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1 through 4. Are we like the Virgin Mary? Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly. And indeed, bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Hmm. A virgin shall conceive, be with child. Chaste virgin. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. Now, I didn't have to read verses 3 and 4 there, but I just wanted to throw that in because that's what this whole thing is about. This whole thing of rejecting the, the term born again, uh, you're getting into another gospel. All right, you're getting into some very dangerous territory. You're rejecting the words of Jesus Christ and Peter and Paul, essentially. Paul did not say born again. I get that side by side, but it's there. All right, um, One born out of due time. I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. It's right there. He's teaching the new birth. But how interesting. We're to be presented as a chaste virgin to Christ. You say, well, it's not his mother. I get that. All right, the chaste virgin is the bride of Christ. I understand. But let me show you another verse that ties into this whole thing. Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. I'll leave you with this as a great challenge as you go on about your life. Mark chapter 3, verse 31 through 35. There came then his brethren and his mother, and standing without sent unto him, calling him. And the multitude sat about him, and they said unto him, Behold thy mother and thy brethren without seek for thee. And he answered them, saying, Who is my mother or my brethren? And he looked round about on them which sat about him, and said, Behold my mother and my brethren. For whosoever will do the will of God, the same as my brother and my sister and mother. <laughs> So, uh, I just want to challenge you with that as a final thought. Now, I'm not going to teach that, you know, we are all become, you know, we'll be all the Virgin Mary when we get to heaven or something. But uh, <clears throat> that's not what I'm teaching, right? But in type, it's there. Christ was formed inside the Virgin Mary. Here's where the challenge comes in. How do you think Mary conducted her life while she was with child? While she could see her stomach getting bigger? as a woman does when they're with child. How do you think that was? At first, you're just a little bit there, and you think, oh, it's okay, I can see a little, tiny bit of a thing of being with child here. But as the stomach gets bigger, and all of a sudden you put your hand down there, and you feel a little kick, a little movement. And the mother starts to feel that heartbeat, and she starts to feel that baby growing in her womb. Do you think Mary was careful? The chaste virgin that Mary was, do you think that she was even more chaste in her conversation? I think so. I think when you'd be walking around carrying a baby that's going to be, that is God, a body hast thou prepared for me, the Bible says. God in the womb of Mary, and she's walking around and she's thinking about that, and she's thinking, I don't want the wrong kind of music around my baby. I don't want the wrong kind of people around my baby. Watch your language. There's a baby forming in here, and the baby is God. How long was he in there? Nine months. But what about when you're a Christian and Christ is formed in you? Now you carry him around for your whole life. Hey, you know what? The Holy Spirit in me is offended by that music. The Holy Spirit is in me is offended by the way you're dressing. 
The Holy Spirit in me is offended by that smoke coming from your cigarettes. The Holy Spirit in me is offended by that alcohol and these drunkards and that, you see? Christ is formed within us. We are born again when you are genuinely saved. Your life is not your own. You're bought with a price. And this satanic modern Gnostic gospel is I can make the profession of faith and go on living however I want. There's no change. There's no dying to the old man. I'm the new man now. I just go to church or something. Uh, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And that's why I've been against church buildings, by the way, for many years now, because of seeing the hypocrisy in every church building. And that is, I get to go to church on Sunday, I put on my nice clothing, I go in and I put on the pageant, and then I can go home and I can live like the devil the rest of the week. And it's, you know, the little psychoanalysts that are out there in the comments section, write your little magic comments and say, oh, Brother Brian, you've been hurt. Oh, and your, your pain that you feel, you're causing, it's causing you to lash out. <laughs> oh, shut up, shut up. Right? I get so sick and tired of that. That's not it at all. My feelings don't get hurt like that. Right? My feelings get hurt, get hurt by false brethren that come along and I think that they got saved and they're learning the truth and then they go back to the world again. All right? But people hurting me and whatever, and that's why I lash. No, it's not in Scripture. Okay? Nobody went to church in Scripture. Christ is formed in you. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. Live like it. Well, I don't really know for sure if, if Christ has been formed me. I can't really say for sure I've been born again. Then you better, you know, get down and start praying and start figuring out what's wrong in your life. I travail in birth again for you. So that's going to be it for this study. Um, I'm going to put a link at the end here to a sermon I did on what does it mean to be born again. Um, but I just want to say this too about the whole thing of the Virgin Mary. Isn't it funny how the Catholics obsess over her? This chaste virgin? How many chaste virgins are in the Catholic Church? Not very many. Um, Catholics obsess over Christians. Genuine Christians. I've seen Catholics try to pretend that they're Bible believers. I've, I've been seeing a lot of these, you know, type, different types of Protestants. You know, they're basically papists. It's, you know, the Catholic is cores and the Protestant is Coors Light, you know, kind of a thing. And you see these guys and they, they'll say, I'm a, as a Bible-believing Christian, I this and that. <laughs> You're not a Bible-believing Christian. You do so many things that are contrary to the Scriptures and adding to the Scriptures. You're not a Bible-believer. But you see, they get obsessed with that chaste virgin thing. Because you have something, if you're born again, that no money can buy. No powerful connections can buy. No secret society membership can buy. If the Holy Spirit of God, Christ, and the Father have been formed in you, you have a connection to the God of the universe, the God of all creation. <laughs> Again, you know, the universe is in the Bible. I understand. I understand. Okay. God of all creation. There. All right. I don't want to upset the wrong people here or whatever else. And you go off on rants and that in the comments section and things. Um, the lost people are watching. All right. They expect us to be different. So uh, that will be it for this study. Um, say born again. Okay. Uh, it's very important. We're to consent to the words, wholesome words of that the Lord Jesus Christ spoke. He said born again. And our beloved brother, Peter, he said born again. And our beloved brother, Paul, said born out of due time. Travail and birth again. He's talking about being born again in both references, brethren. That's what he's talking about. If you want to squabble and fight about it and everything else, well then go do it someplace else. I don't have time for it here. Uh, I really don't. I don't have the energy for it. Uh, I get really sick and tired of people that are professing Christians and that they're, they don't have the Holy Spirit of truth in them. So um, that's going to be it for this study. And uh, thank you very much for watching. See you in upcoming videos.